spring semester. I'm really delighted to be able to welcome Dr. Nan Zhu here from the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Um, she's a staff scientist and the group leader of the China Energy Group at LBNL and director of the U.S. China Clean Energy Center Building Energy Efficiency Program. Um, she's engaged with a complex joint U.S.-China stakeholder matrix and facilitated creation of a research program portfolio to focus on breakthrough energy efficiency building technologies. She's managing three major programs at LBNL and Chinese organizations, the LBNL Shenzhen Institute for Buildings Research, Joint Program on Sustainable Communities, the LBNL Energy Efficiency Training Program for Chinese Industries, and the Tongji University LBNL Berkeley uh, Joint Postdoc Program. Dr. Zhu's research is focused on modeling and evaluating China's low carbon development strategies, assessing building energy efficiency policies and technologies, and development and evaluation of China's compliance standards and labeling program. She's also worked <coughs> excuse me, on energy efficiency in industry and assessments of energy efficiency policies. Her work assists the Chinese government in connecting high-level policy goals, energy security, economic growth, and equity with changes in energy investment, supply, and efficiency. She has a total of more than 100 publications um, and has an architecture degree from Xi'an University of Architecture and Technology um, in China, a master's in architecture from Kyushu University in Japan, a PhD in engineering from Kyushu Sangyu University in Japan, and was an assistant professor in the Department of Architecture also um, in Japan before um, arriving in the United States to her um, position at Mark Berkeley National Labs. We're really interested in her uh, presentation. Thanks for making the trip. <coughs> Good morning or good afternoon. It's uh, just in between. I'm very delighted to be invited uh, to come to Princeton and uh, to have the opportunity to talk about some of the work we've done recently that could be of interest for all of you. Um, I really admire all of you, have the opportunity to study and do research here. And I went to university in China, undergraduate, and then I went to graduate school in Japan. I was not able to get in a, such a prestigious university in either country. Uh, so today I will uh, mainly talk about uh, the work we have done related to China's revolution of energy and demand and supply by 2050, basically mid-century with a focus on buildings and build environment, because I know many of you are from civil engineer, environmental engineering um, department. And my name is Nanjo. I'm a staff scientist, as introduced by uh, Denise, and uh, at the Lawrence Berkeley National Library. <coughs> So I don't know um, if you all know where I'm from, the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. I think some of you know, in our lab we have many scientists probably graduated from Princeton and in the past. A very quick introduction, our lab is a Department of Energy lab, and we're one of the uh, 17 national laboratories, um, but we're also probably the biggest and oldest laboratory. It was established in 1931. And by a um, Nobel laureate, Ernest uh, Orlando. And so we are managed by UC Berkeley, which is also interesting. Even though we're DOE lab, we're not considered government employees, we're considered UC employees. And so we're managed by them, and then uh, I think uh, a lot of the um, uh, benefits we have the, in terms of human resource, the way of managing is very similar to universities. So when we established the lab, we had a mission of solving the most pressing and profound scientific problem and facing humankind. And uh, for us, it's right now, it's energy and environment and climate change. And those are really critical and the problems we're facing today. And also build and, uh, and operate world-class scientific facilities. So that's hardware. So that's laboratories, and facilities that are open for public, for everybody to come and to take a tour, but also do tests and experiments there. 
that's open to everybody. And train the next generation scientists and engineers. Uh, and we have about 4,000 uh, employees, and then including many postdocs. Uh, you can see the number here, about 500. And then we also work with UC students a lot, UC Berkeley, Davis, and uh, they come as uh, graduate student assistant. So we work on um, the same topic also a lot. And some of our uh, scientists are joint faculty members, so they're also UC Berkeley professor. Work. So the group I'm from is called the China Energy. Uh, it's funded in 1988, which is, I think, the oldest group uh, outside of the U.S. and that's focused on researching issues related to energy in China. So my group leader, uh, past the founder of the group, called him Mark Levine, whose picture is showing on the right top side, he had this vision, China is going to be very important. So he set up that back then nobody had an interest. And then nobody was uh, and doing research in energy efficiency. People, when talk about energy, people were thinking about oil, gas, coal, supply. But nobody was thinking about the conservation of energy and how we can make the use of energy more efficient. So he set up the group and mostly trying to bring the best practice experiences in the US to China and to help them become more efficient. By the way, Mark Levine uh, is from Princeton, and originally. Um, so we currently have 17 staff members full time and doing China-related research. We think we're the biggest in the U.S. Uh, when it's uh, come to the China-related research, <coughs> uh, we also have visiting scholar program. We attract about 20 uh, annually uh, visiting scholars, and to our group, they stay most of the time for a year, but some six months or two years. And most of them are university professors and PhD students. But also we have government officials and people from think tank. And they want to come here to learn how US makes policy. Um, our group is very small, but we have many projects, annually 50 different projects. That's because because we're doing China, most of our research projects related to China, they're very small scale. And nobody is bold and brave enough to give a large funding to do a, just a international studies. Um, I don't know if you guys face the same dilemma. It's always very tough. Uh, we've been seen as a trust advisors to DOE um, and State Department and the EPA in the US and then also um, trusted partner for Chinese government. And uh, we actually help the US and Chinese government um, providing technical basis when they made the climate change agreement. Uh, now it's a year and a half ago. And also at the Paris meeting. When they, China announced they will meet uh, the peaking of the CO2 emission by 2030. That was, a, we provide a lot of scientific basis uh, with our research result to the State Department also China side through our collaborators. Here's a list of our research area that covers everything uh, related to energy and the summer environment. So it's long-term energy modeling, smart and resilient cities, uh, green and efficient industry, high performance buildings and products, and the resilient energy system planning the grid integration, energy market policy initiative, and then energy and the water nexus. These are new initiatives we just added. And down below you can see our mission um, is to help, number one, uh, the foreign institution organization understand China better, like today's uh, the event. Or, and sometimes we help China to become more efficient. And then we serve as a bridge. And so we are also secretary for a number of very important US-China high-level collaborative programs. So, those are our mission. So now I can start with some introduction of today's talk. And I, you probably all know China has made astonishing and uh, economic growth in the last 30 years. Uh, and, uh, but at the same time, their environment has been significantly damaged. And you can see some chart. The one on the left top shows primary energy consumption 
from 1980. For so many years, it was increasing steadily. But suddenly, around the 2002, you can see the skyrocketing. The trend has changed. And so then, I think by 2010 or 11, the energy consumption exceeded the US. So it became the world number one energy consumer. And if you can look at the by fuel, um, in the US, uh, the different fuel use, and in China, and it's similar, you can see blue part is dominant in China. <coughs> and that is uh, mostly coal. And in the past, it was. 80%, 70%. Recently, the share has been dropping, but it still is dominant. 60, 70% are coal. I think in the US, it's roughly 30 or 40, 40% uh, on the right hand side. So you can see, even though China's energy consumption exceeded the US, it's a little bit above, but because their coal uh, is, they use so much more and which brought so much environmental problems. You can see the smog, uh, PM 2.5 issue in Beijing. This is a real picture we took from office. We were having a meeting. And then the picture, uh, we, were, we were walking on the street. Everybody just wrapped their head and face with masks and the scarf. Uh, you couldn't see like a three meter, two meters uh, ahead of you. And river has been damaged and soil and there's so many numbers and you can see 10% of river and their quality is worse than the lowest grade. Uh, climate change, similar. Uh, and now China's and uh, carbon emission already account for more than a quarter of the entire world uh, and, uh, emission. So, and you see those um, trends and the consequences, but China is still <coughs> developing. And uh, you can see the per capita base. Here's a per capita energy consumption on the right hand side. US 7.2 TOE per person, oil equivalent. China is only 1.97. And here's the more numbers here urbanization. <coughs> US is 80%. China is only 50. <clears throat> car ownership, China is only 10. You see a lot of cars in China on the street, but it's only 10%. And US is uh, 60% or 70. So they will still, they're still growing. And they continue to grow, and they want to reach the level eventually that's close to the developed country. So can we imagine? And those situation I showed you earlier could get worse six times more. So that's a really uh, critical point uh, that China is facing to make and continue that trend. So in the early 2014, uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping uh, made this statement, and he particularly called out China must promote the revolution of energy production and consumption because they knew with the, that pattern and the use of energy, there's no way they can sustain the growth they have today. Because of all the, not just the environmental damage, but also energy security issues. Would China have six times more energy to fuel its economy? And the, quite, the answer probably is not. So I mentioned it earlier in US, China and made this agreement on uh, related climate change in the end of 2040, which the, again announced during the Paris meeting a year ago. And so for the country to achieve a peaking of CO2 emission, because today it's continued to grow, and so they want to peak CO2 by 2030, and then not this works, they will try best to peak it earlier. Um, and then they also want to increase the share of non-fossil fuel to 20% by 2030. Non-fossil fuel means uh, renewables and hydro, and but also nuclear. So that's the goal they set and for them. With that background in mind, uh, our group started a um, really big project called Reinventing Fire China. Some of the you probably heard Emory Lovett's book and Reinventing Fire. That's for the U.S. We collaborated with RMI and then together with um, 
the China's think tank, Keyset Energy, ERI, Energy Research Institute, under their super ministry. They're really the think tank developing policy, but also with support from Energy Foundation. So we launched this project about four years ago and worked very closely with all these uh, other partners. And then eventually, we completed a study recently and analyzed the cost-effective technology opportunities and created a solution roadmap. The policy question we had in mind was, can China meet its energy need and at the same time improve the energy security, but also improve the environmental quality and deploy maximum feasible share of cost-efficient, uh, effective energy efficiency and renewable energy supply by 2050. Can you do all of those at this one time? And so we took a really unique process, unlike the usual academic study, we sit behind our desk and do a research graduate course, we go make a presentation. So this one we wanted to be helpful for the policy and so we organized an advisory panel consisting of uh, really key government advisors, and some were officials and they were still in office. And we had many rounds of review meetings and advisory meetings, and here's, you can see a number of them. We invite our Chinese collaborators to come to our lab, lab and stay three months. We sat there side by side and went over every assumption, every data, and to make sure, and they have buy-in. Um, and then we also develop a model that can help us to do all these analysis. And then lastly, we also organize many technical workshops, so that's by sector, whether it's buildings, industry, transport. We had a sector, um, sectorial expert to come and to vet whether our projection for future car ownership looks in reasonable or things like that. So finally, um, yeah, we developed the two scenarios, one called the reference scenario, and one is called the reunting fire scenario. The reference scenario is not a frozen baseline. It's what we think and they will be like without a new policy. So current policy will continue to have impact, and there will still be autonomous change. Like te technology will always develop, with or without, uh, intervention of policy. They will always advance, and those were included in that reference case. The reality fire scenario and represents <coughs> a scenario we try to maximize the adoption of commercialized, cost-effective, efficient technology. That is to say, no new breakthrough. People will say uh, some new, what about fusion? What about the fuel cell? What about CCS? And those that technology that are not completely commercialized, we did not include. We only look at the ones already uh, in the market, and then we consider the cost effective. So that's the result. It's a really, uh, <coughs> actually, jaw dropping. Mm -hmm. We found that China can grow its GDP by six times with the increase of only 1% of the primary energy. And 55% uh, of the energy are non emitting meaning they're from non-fossil fuels. And then we can achieve a 42% of CO2 emission reduction and compared with 2010 um, base year. Still, we can create 21 trillion RMB net present value benefits. So this result is jaw dropping and all using 100% technical, feasible, cost-effective, and socially acceptable. We weren't um, projecting some technology will be adopted 100% because people will have different choices. For example, people may not like electric cars, and or they may just have a personal and the choices to this technology. So just a quick question about sure. the benefit. So it excludes, excludes environmental gains. But you said the R&D, I mean, is this just a reduction of the cost of energy uh, that, that China is using? Or what do you exactly yeah. mean? It is a reduction of energy cost. Okay. Yeah. Just say yeah. Yeah. And then you can see the results uh, in the charts. Um, basically, there's a 2010 value, a 2050 reference case. And then you can see 2050 really fire scenario. 
can actually achieve that 47, almost half reduction. And, uh, and the reduction comes from these different three sectors. And you, you can see the sector breakdown. Uh, blue part is building. <coughs> Orange is industry. This is interesting because if you look at the 2010 value, industry dominates the total energy consumption. It's almost 60 or 70 percent. Building and transport are very small today. But then you can see those will grow bigger, industry will shrink. And then the reduction potential by 2050 will mainly be coming from buildings, transport, and some industry. How do we make those uh, happen? So here are the list of strategies we took in the different sectors. Uh, this is just a summary of each one and for each sectors. And in industry, and mostly there's a structure shift to from the heavy industry to manufacturing. Higher value added products, they're less energy intensive. Production demand reduction. And that's related to a lot of material China produce because they're not high quality. So they don't last very long. Buildings last 25 years on average in China. Here, I don't know our campus, some buildings maybe 100 years. <laughs> and in China, on average 25 to 30 years, then how they can over. And material equipment, similarly, the quality is lower and they don't last long. Therefore, you have to and have a lot of the cycles. Uh, and therefore, you have all the demand for cement, iron, steel, glass, every time you rebuild it. So if you can reduce those waste, and then we don't have the demand, and then we won't have the supply. So that's the second point. And then they have to improve efficiency, and then also decarbonize the industry by using more electric or renewables. For buildings, I will talk more later. Uh, so, and uh, here I, I won't go into each one. And this is the transportation. Similarly, activity reduction, meaning we have to reduce the trip needed and through uh, many, many ways uh, optimize our trips. Like that would include public transit, uh, it could include telecommuting, uh, and then also freight, trucks. If they can be optimized in their dispatch, like if they in China, the trucks and they carry goods to somewhere, and then when they come back, they're empty. And that's a waste, uh, and it's a waste of the space, right, for the trucks. In the US, I think that's called the load factor, is about 70%. So 70% of the time, it's carrying goods. But in China, those trucks, they go there, and they unload, and they, they come back empty. So only 40%. So, and they have to do more to carry the same amount of so if we can reduce those demand, similarly improve the efficiency in transportation sector, such as using hybrid cars or other really efficient cars. And also uh, fuel switching. Switching away from oil and to gas or electric. And all these switching it can all help reduce energy and emission. Transformation on uh, this sector it's basically power generation, oil refining, coking, anything that transform from primary energy to final energy. And so that's happened there. Uh, and there, because power generation is also there, then we need to have clean uh, power generation, such as renewables. And also uh, distributed energy, distribu distributed solar PVs, and uh, wind turbine, all these and but also incorporating smart grid. So those were the key strategies and uh, we took step by step. So after the demand reduction and there's a shifting uh, the supply to non-fossil fuel sources. And you can see it in those two scenarios and not only did the overall absolute amount of the energy consumption reduced, but also the fuel share change. And you can see the red is coal. It's really big right now. 
But that will end peak and then started going down around 2030 in China. Uh, and this in the reference case. In the remitting fire case, uh, you can see that and peaking earlier and going down much faster. And overall energy consumption is much lower. So I mentioned earlier China has two goals. One is 2030 peaking goal, one is non-fossil goal. And so are they meeting it? Uh, so let's look at this number. Uh, 2030 is what they said they want to have. Um, so the China has also a very interesting conversion factor. It's called the CPCC. I don't know if you know IPCC, the conversion from uh, primary to final energy. China uses this interesting conversion factor. Basically, they say, uh, if we're generating how much gigawatt, for example, wind or solar, we're actually avoiding and three times more coal power plant, something like that. So they're using the avoided coal power plant's emission as their uh, in the emission factor. So that's why you see the number they report is higher than uh, the standard, international standard one. But with their standards, it's 20% 20, 20 in the whole um, economy. And but in the, I think I mentioned earlier, China's goal was to have 20% right, by 2030. So in the reference case, they can already meet it. In the remaking fire case, they can do even more. Got it, but I don't understand why a uh, politically expedient measure should be used in place of an international measure and then assert that they've achieved a goal that has not, in fact, been achieved because the baseline that they're referencing uh, is artificial uh, and relative rather than absolute. Yes, I think that that's a very important point. Um, the, the goal they, they set, they are relative, number one. For the peaking goal, uh, and it was a, a big progress step forward, but also there's no absolute number in there. So they are leaving a little bit of room, and uh, it's for political reasons. Um, they must have done underlying analysis to show they could, have achieve, could achieve that, but for political and negotiations, I think it's a safer to leave some rules. And in terms of using the, these, uh, these target, uh, you're absolutely right, because if they can reduce total de demand, some of their share could be higher or lower. So there's a, they have different way of achieving that. So I think this is uh, probably also why they can have a target for gigawatt or terawatt. Um. I have a question. Um, going back to the, the RF scenario, it, it appears that it's assuming that coal usage um, already peaks by, by about right now. Is that already the case? I'm, I'm just confused why the reference scenario shows it going up all yeah. the way past 2020. But in the reinventing fire scenario, you've already peaked at about what? Uh, I can't the most. Yeah. <coughs> That's right. The coal peaking is a big topic in China now. So actually, the coal consumption in 2014 or 15 declined. So some people are saying maybe it's already peaked. Um, but we don't know yet. We want <coughs> to kind of figure out whether it's just short-term phenomena or it's a long-term trend. And so here we're uh, projecting around the 2020, but it's not a really accurate year. You can see the whole period from 2040 to 20 is like a plateau. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to say which year, and we're not trying to do the short-term forecasting. But nonetheless, we're showing the point that coal is uh, already there. It's uh, probably either peak or very close to peaking. It may not be. This year, it could be next two years, but that's the trend, very important trend uh, we're seeing. So in the power generation sector, that was all transformation. So this is particularly electricity generation. And then you can also see in this rain fire scenario, there will be more electrification. And then also uh, more renewables, more nuclear here. Red is coal again, 
Uh, and then you will have this uh, natural gas and nuclear and wind, solar, hydro, all these renewables, all together for the power sector. And 82% are non-emitting, non-fossil sources. So that's quite impressive. So even though the overall economy, we were saying 20, but in power sector, this is still very aggressive. So with that, China can achieve early peaking, because early peaking wasn't our goal. Uh, our results show, like for coal use, as I mentioned, around 2020, but could be any time from 2014, uh, and then will peak, and then started going down. Uh, CO2 emissions without uh, the intervention uh, probably will peak around 2036, <coughs> a much higher level. And uh, with the reinventing fire scenario, it will peak around 2025. So this will be earlier than 2030. Even primary energy, and which will peak later, uh, and by doing the reinventing fire scenario, we can still achieve a peak of 2034. This is also, again, a very important finding because back three, four years ago, nobody believed China's energy and consumption could actually peak. Because the, the trend before that is always going up and up and up. So nobody could anticipate this is coming. So now, co-benefit. By doing those strategies, China can also reduce <coughs> SO2 and NOx at the same time. So this is a, a chart showing how much and they can reduce uh, in each year by applying those energy efficiency, clean energy and solutions. And you can see they can reduce SOx and NOx by almost 70 or 80%. This is a level, according to our Chinese collaborator, is a level with before, right after Cultural Revolution, uh, right before China started doing, producing anything. So like in 1972, three, and level. Back then China had blue skies, everything. Um, so that's the level they think they can reduce. Are those reductions coming because of switching to clean energy primary supply, or are they also coming because of the application of end pipe controls on? No end of pipe control. No end pipe yeah, control. it's all those uh, strategies I mentioned: demand reduction, efficiency improvement, fuel switching. <coughs> um, so this chart shows the economics, and so somebody asked a question. We did a calculation of total investment needed, uh, which is shown here, for all different sector strategies. And uh, then we look at the, uh, the return, which is in terms of fuel saved. Uh, and it's shown here. And the net in is about 22 uh, trillion RRB. So you can see that you can still achieve uh, a very good economic benefit. It's not like uh, it will harm the economy. And if we look at some of the by the different sector in terms of peak, and they look slightly different. So this one shows uh, industry. Yes. So this is the industry. Industry will peak much earlier, 2020, because heavy industry. I don't know if you, if you have been to China recently, you know their iron steel plants, cement plants, lot of them are closed because they're over capacity. <coughs> and all slowed down. And so we think of this industry energy uh, can probably peak around 2020, which is much earlier. And this is uh, for buildings. That's later because people will still want to have comfort. In the summer, we want to have uh, cooling. In the winter, we want to have heating. We want lights. We want hot water. We need to cook. It, we just can't cut all this comfort. Uh, and it's also human behavior, many things. And we want more services. We're using more equipment. We, we have uh, smartphones, smart TV. We keep adding new stuff, gadgets, into our households and offices. So 
that will continue to grow for a while, but still can probably peak around 2030 to use the efficient technologies. Transport peaks even later. Again, that's the demand still growing. More cars will be added on the road. <coughs> and uh, so as a result, they will peak around 2035. So this result is being released at the G20 meeting in September last year, a summary. And we're in the middle of producing sectoral report in Chinese. <laughs> and uh, eventually they will be in English. But the exact summary is bilingual. It, it can be downloaded from the website. So from here, I will shift my focus to building because earlier I showed how important buildings, the building environment is. And so globally, building accounts for 40% of the total uh, CO2 emission. Uh, and then US and China, this is the chart for US and China, together accounts for 40% of the global building. So these two are very important. And the US consumes more energy per capita. China, right now, is very low. We looked at earlier. It's only one-fifth. But they are still growing, growing faster. So we share the same challenges. So here's some um, figure interesting. This is the, the built environment in the US. And you probably are familiar with Built environment goes beyond just building. So that includes uh, pavement, and it includes <coughs> building materials. Uh, and it's used to build buildings, glass, everything we use that's for buildings, they have carbon energy footprint. So when we look <coughs> at that whole built environment, it accounts for 51% of total US energy, and 55% of total CO2. This is huge. Is, so it's most single important sector. And then you can see the other transportation is 27, industry is only 22. So within that 51%, uh, you can see around 39% of our operation. This is what we typically see. It's a, the lighting, electricity we use, or heating we use, cooking. But here's also this embodied part material and in the buildings and the infrastructure, that accounts for 12%. This is usually overlooked. We don't think about it. We only see what we're using here. But if we don't build buildings, we don't need to consume those energies. China. China, between 1990 and 2010, added 300 million urban population. That's a equivalent to the entire US population. Additional 300 million is going to be added by 2050. And the 50 billion square meter of new build and the plant. And then in every 5 million buildings, 50 thousand of which uh, there could be skyscrapers, and the equivalent of 10 New York cities, just as skyscrapers, to give us the magnitude of all the buildings. At the same time, I mentioned earlier, China's building lifetime is really short. One is because of building material, cement, iron steel, but also a lot of our man-made. And you can see you can see buildings like the school, probably only 10 years old, for redevelopment, they have to turn down. Similarly, this building is in my hometown, Xi'an. It's a brand new building, not even occupied. It was sitting there for three years, they decided to change to some other purpose. So they just lost, it's a, just a year ago, two years ago. And so all these, they, when they rebuild, all these uh, materials they used to build, it's been wasted, resources. And that's a phenomenon, and you can see it everywhere. It's not just this example. As a result, China's cement production accounts for half of the world total. China's steel production accounts for half of the world. So basically, it's like saying China was building the new construction and it accounts for half of the entire world construction each year. So similar figures as we saw earlier for China. Um, China's built environment, this is smaller figures, 37%. 
That's because the current building is still small. Industry is major. But the CO2 figure is very high, and that's because they're co-dominated um, economy. And then when you look at the other sector, industry, still 50%, so still very big. Transportation, small, 9%. So within this 37%, you will see the difference. The operation piece is only 23, and material is 14%. The ratio of material to operation is much larger when compared with the US. So that's because the US has much longer lifetime our average building lifetime in the U.S. I think is 70 years or 80 years. And then as a result, you don't need all these materials to turn it over and over and many times. So the embodied part in China actually is really high, almost half of the population. So if we can reduce that, uh, the waste, and so we can reduce overall energy. Here's a list of China's current building uh, sector situation. I won't go into detail. But very quickly, um, Chinese people use much less energy per capita in-house, but not because they're building efficient. US buildings are a lot more efficient. It's because Chinese people are using less. And if you've been to China in the winter, and you will know, in, uh, for example, Shanghai, Sichuan, there's no heating. People are just wearing down jackets indoor. And also, a lot of places like a rural area, there's no cooling. Therefore, they don't use much. So they're low energy, but not necessarily efficient. And there's uh, all other uh, and, uh, status included here. And I, I, I don't want to go detail. Anyway, so the strategy we thought about taking to address the growing demand in the building sector or building environment sector are these. So we thought in the China can use integrated design. And so when you do integrated design, you think about different measures at the same time. It's not like when you already have the building, let's change a window or let's change a light. That's more costly and doesn't get you the return need. So here, from the beginning, you will think, what can we, how can we achieve multiple goals at the same time? If we can have a larger window area, you will have more daylight, and you don't need it on this light. But if the window is a, a very good window, uh, like the, the double pane and the low E, all these windows, and they're very efficient, so they could be very good in the winter, uh, and also for the summer too. Or if that has some smart control, uh, like a stage glass, and they have so-called electric chromatic window, they can create shading automatically. Then in the summer, and they can actually block the sunshine to make the indoor cooler, so you don't need as much cooling. So if you can think of some of those design, you can reduce the demand. And then also, by doing prefabricated building, uh, you can reduce the waste, as I mentioned. You can recycle a lot of the modules, because the build module of the whole facade has walls and insulation, ceiling, everything around it, and assembled on site. And you can also build it faster. I don't know if you saw the YouTube video of this Chinese building, 25 story, they built it in two weeks or 12 days in Hunan. And so you can build it much faster and they're efficient. You can deploy the efficiency at a much faster speed and it reduce the waste. And then roughly, I think the waste can be reduced by 10 to 15%. And then once you have the building and you can use super efficient appliances, there are many air conditioners, refrigerators, uh, and they're available. You can find uh, the Energy Star uh, and they're much more efficient, safe electricity. And, and you can use smart control or demand response um, to use solar PV on top and then storage. And in the future, you can use your EV electric vehicle for storage, charge and discharge. And also to have more renewable sources. And with all these, then you can reduce quite a bit of energy and the 
definition. So the last one is called the passive building. This is a passive building actually is traditionally, um, it's traditional, a lot of traditional buildings are pass, uh, passive. Like the cave building, that's passive. Um, you don't need to do much, uh, you don't need uh, technologies, they're comfortable. And, uh, but the, these days we adding a lot of technology, so we're adding a lot of um, energy as well. So if you can do more passive ones, actually this is the picture, then again you don't need much technology. So this research is backed up by many case studies. It's not just uh, theoretical, and, and we found almost a case study for every strategy we took. So here are a number of them, just very quickly. This is a building building, Shenzhen, southern China, very hot and humid. They use natural ventilation, they use shady, and they use also the facade and all these design. As a result, their energy consumption is 40 to 70% of the <coughs> average building in this area. AC system use 40% less. And their cost, I remember, was only 10%. Passive house built in Qinghuangdao, northern China, and they use German um, passive house standards. So they made very good insulation in the house and the seal around the window, which is a big problem in China. In China, there's always a lot of holes in the wall and around windows. It's also leakage. So if they seal well and they insulate well, this demonstrate can reduce heating demand by 62%. Some of you may know China used district heating in northern China in the winter. And this building is off the district heating supply network. They don't need that because they, their heating demand is reduced and with a little bit of ground source heat on, they can meet the demand. So that's just another example. But the, there were still air conditioners on it, so it's not really a passive building. Right. For air conditioner, it is a little bit difficult. It was still lower because of uh, the high insulation, glass, and all these things. Still the lower uh, compared with the buildings nearby. But the reduction is not as high as for heat. Therefore, these buildings are very good, very suited for northern Chinese. But for southern China, they want more natural ventilation. So, and there's a trade-off. Similarly, there's this efficient appliances we can use. There are already net zero energy buildings uh, using solar PV, and that's just an example. And this is a prefab building, a very famous uh, real estate developer in China, Banke. I think many of our Chinese students probably know. The CEO is Wang Shi, and it's very famous in climate change advocates. And they build a lot of these prefab buildings. Here you can see. The lifetime is 10 to 15 years longer. Material consumption 60% less. Building waste is 80%. And there's roughly 5 to 10% energy efficiency. And then if you look at each of the strategy, we look at the contribution, uh, waterfall. And you can see a lot of the reduction can be achieved through better design and also <coughs> Uh, passive house, prefabricated building. So it's designed a construction phase. You can already uh, reduce 50. And then once you have the building, you need to use these appliances better, use efficient ones. So that's just a rough uh, contribution to the strategy. Again, we did the net present value calculation for building. Similarly, and you, you will have this written out by technology. The, the key point is that you will have net present uh, value in return. And you invest this much, but you get more. Achieving that full adoption technology, has, you have barrier. Let's say all these great buildings, why can't every building build that way? So here are a list of the barrier we, we looked at. Split the incentives, so who's owning it? If you do retrofit the building, who gets a benefit? Is that owner or occupants or developer? An energy manager is not uh, clear. And energy pricing and transaction costs too high and lack of information. Nobody knows how much energy they're using. 
all these variants we found. So to address the variant, we turn it into policy recommendation, which I know Professor Denise and her group also does, but more on the environmental side, our protection side. These for energy, we found they need to do more codes and standards. So they're mandatory, and they need to enforce it better. They need to do more disclosure and have more transparency. Right now, and they, don't just, they just don't have great data on energy consumption of buildings or cities. And so and then market forces. So right now, China's power sector, their profit is based on the sales of electricity. And unlike in the US, in California, PG&E utilities, and they have to do energy efficiency because they have decoupled and sales from a generation. So they also have programs to improve the energy efficiency, but China doesn't. So they have no incentive to have you to reduce energy because they will make the less money. So there's that market forces. Energy price is still low also. And then lastly, financing. We need to have capital. But currently, the world has a lot of capital, a lot of money, a lot of money in China, a lot of money in the US, but they're not put in the place where needed help. And uh, like these energy efficiency and clean tech, how can we bridge this, this gap? So the capital started flowing into these projects. So we, again, recommend a number of policies there. So that's all. And then here's the last slide. It's a summary. Um, and I already talked about the bigger points. Overall, China's economy and really developed uh, an amazing way in the past, but it cannot be continued with the current energy consumption power. And we started this um, project, Women in Far China, and figured out the roadmap China can actually meet its energy demand. And without further damaging their environment and also to have more energy security. And also for building sector, um, they can reduce demand through better design, construction, envelope, improve the efficiency of appliances, equipment, and then also switch to cleaner technology. And lastly, to capture this potential, we need a number of new policies. So that's a, a really summary of the, my talk. And thank you, and I'd like to see if you have more questions. So uh, how likely is the Chinese government to adopt such very aggressive measures uh, on its own? And if the, you know now that the U.S. elected a country continent as president, <laughs> uh, it's not going to abide by any of these treaties with China. Will China go forward regardless of what the U.S. does? Yeah, China will for sure will go ahead because um, to them, it's not just a pressure from climate change. It's really the energy security. China's already importing not to mention oil and gas net importer. China was already importing coal. So they're net importer. And of all these, there's geopolitics and there's environmental issue domestically. The PM2.5 caused by burning of coal and oil. So they have many and these uh, obstacles they have to overcome. So they will, and despite what the US does, will continue to, that's what their government leader said. If the US backs up, we will be the leader. And because for domestic benefits, that's what they have to do anyways. Um, without the US collaboration, I think um, China's always very good at creation, um, but uh, they probably will go a little slower because in the R&D phase, uh, China can still learn a lot from the US. Uh, I manage the US China Clean Energy Research Center, which is really R&D. And we found a lot of times the US companies and research we're developing new technologies. Our Chinese counterparts want to apply it. Uh, they want to test it, demonstrate it in the building. They're more willing to test it. US owners, nobody wants to risk their building to test anything new. 
Chinese are a lot more willing. They want to test, they want to see what they apply, and they want to use it. They're a lot more willing to use that, those technologies. So actually, I think if, if, uh, if we have a good policy for Trump, uh, President Trump, we realize that that area could be a very good opportunity for businesses to. Because we have technology. They have markets. US public, we all want to go there. Uh, and but if China probably won't say if we want to do something just benefit you. <laughs> so you need to think something that's benefiting for both countries. So I think if purely without any collaboration from the US side, I think that that's a, a shame, a real shame. Eventually China will give up their own. They will have like they always did. And you can look at it from their nuclear, their uh, it, the missile, whatever, they, they have their own technique, they close door, they can do this. But with U.S. and other countries' experience, they can do it much faster. And then they can be good for U.S. too, right? It's a market for U.S., it's, a, it's also a test bed for the U.S. technologies. Okay. Just want to make sure I heard something correctly. If I understood your initial <coughs> Projections, they were that the Chinese economy would increase by sixfold. Yeah. Right? And emissions would decrease by 50%. Yeah. That's, and this was without any new technology, if I understood what you That's said right. at the beginning, just using existing yeah. off the shelf resources yeah. that could be deployed. Right? Yeah, that's right. That's six times GDP. We, at LBL, we were a little bit uh, uncertain as a number given um, by our Chinese collaborator. That's <laughs> They did a calculation, Chinese uh, income per capita should achieve OECD level today, or whatever, by 2050. Then you multiply by population. So that's the number we get. But we don't know what it's going to look like. Six times GDP, it's going to be the entire world's GDP today. So we're not economists, we don't know <laughs> what that means. <laughs> can it, uh, can one country have GDP like the entire world today? Right. So, but that's the, uh, at least theoretically, that's what it is. And so, um, in the scenarios that you were discussing with existing technology, how much of the economy gets electrified? Or is that something yeah, that's... Yeah, very good question. Um, so, a lot of people, when they're looking at the electrification, renewables, they make estimate by saying, okay, U.S. is 70%, Japan 80 maybe China is also said, or per capita, U.S. is using this much kilowatt hour, Chinese will, will they use those proxy. But we think that, that has a lot of limitation because you have to look at the end use. What is using electricity? Which can be switched to electricity? So we did it here by the end use technology. We found when we added up, it's uh, 40%. Because, um, Obviously, industry sector is very hard to electrify. You can electrify transportation, but only for cars, not for trucks, not for airplanes, not for ships, only cars right now. And uh, building is easy. You, you can have the entire building being electrified. So but the industry and transport, and you can't. So it, at the end, we found that it's only 40%. What proportion of the con industry is a certain proportion of yeah. output right now? What will it be in 2050, according to your? Yeah, I think the industry was still 40 some percent. It's 60, 70 now. It, no. It's still big because China, um, unlike the U.S., is like a 30 percent now. But the China thinks they are, they will be more like uh, Korea or Japan. They really want to maintain the manufacturing. So, so they will do policies to promote that. Naturally, if we let it just naturally happen, it could be just 20, 30 percent eventually. But government has this vision. They want to still be a manufacturing country. So still there will be 40, 40 percent. Thank you. Thank you so much for that fascinating and optimistic outlook. Yes,